Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Rob Built. I'm your host, and this is my and this is my 300 square foot tiny home in Los Angeles, California. And now we do the uh, the thing. Before we get into today's tiny house financial overview, I just wanted to quickly speak from my heart. Uh, it's my Bill Paxton, which taken too soon. When I got started on this journey about six months ago, my first goal was to hit a thousand subscribers. I hit that last week. So I just wanted to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for A, watching my content and B, liking it enough to keep watching. So uh, I guess while we're on this subject, if you wouldn't mind hitting the like button, it does help me out with the YouTube algorithm and hit the subscribe button if you want more DIY and tiny house updates from me. This is actually my second video on my Los Angeles tiny house. The first one I released back in April and provides a little bit more of a general overview on my experience with this tiny house. I'll link to that up here so that you can watch that after this video. This one's going to get a little bit more into the financial nitty gritty, meaning how much it cost me to build, how did I finance this build, and what I make with a long term and a short term renter in this specific tiny house. Now as far as tiny houses are concerned, this is the first one that I've ever built. This is my prototype and I consider this my crowning achievement just because while I was handy at the beginning of this build, Build. nothing makes you handy like having to build a house and uh, when I say build I mean I didn't actually build it myself I general contracted I was kind of the owner builder on this house but uh, at the 80% mark I ran out of money and I had to kind of kick out that crew and I had to finish the rest of it so I finished the last 20% of this house I stained and I put up the wood that you see behind me I stained the concrete floors I installed the uh, butcher block countertops I did the shiplap inside the house I did the laminate uh, I did the wire, all the finish out wiring and all the finishing plumbing. And uh, like I said, I was okay at that kind of stuff before, but uh, it was really on this house that I cut my teeth and kind of learned how to swing a hammer, as they say. And really why I hold this skill very valuable for me is because at this point in my career and at this point in my life, I don't really swing hammers as much anymore. Now I kind of professionally contract everything out, but it's nice to know that I have the ability to because now I know whenever my contractor is BSing me or when a tradesperson is coming and giving me bids, I know what things should cost and what things shouldn't cost. And then I can also weigh that against my own ability. And so if I feel like I can save a lot of money doing work myself, then I do that. Let's just get into the build price of this specific house. So this house cost me $72,000 to build from beginning to end. And that included all my permits, all my building fees, all my materials, all my labor, everything. The 2.0 of this house, which is in Joshua Tree, cost me about $165,000, but it is a little bit more blown out and it does have a little bit more bells and whistles. And I professionally contracted every aspect of that build. But this one was about half the price. And that's basically because I did a lot of the work and I was a general contractor slash owner builder of this. So I was able to save a lot of money on contracting fees as well. As far as day-to-day -day operations were concerned, there were two people on site every single day. These were my builders. They were a brother and a sister. and they basically built the entire structure from scratch. I mean, they poured the foundation, they did the rebar, they dug everything out, they did the sewage, the piping, the plumbing. And while these two were super talented and gifted, there were certain things that they couldn't do and those two things were HVAC and electrical. So I hired an HVAC team to come and install my mini splits, which I swear by and I'll always swear by because they're super efficient and they're very quick at cooling and heating a room and space. But beforehand, the brother and the sister ran the line sets and the electrical to the mini splits themselves. So right there, I saved a lot of money and I think I only spent $800 for my HVAC. Now for electrical, I had to call in a favor with my father-in-law because he used to be a contractor and electrician. So he came in and did all the rough wiring for this house. And I actually did all the finished wiring myself, meaning I'm the one that actually did all the connection points in the house. I, I wired the GFCI outlets. I wired all outlets, light switches. And at the time it was super complicated. And there was one night where I was up until six in the morning working on one light switch because it was all new to me and I couldn't figure it out but I just kept reading, I kept researching, and I, I learned it finally. And now, uh, I wouldn't say that I know it like the back of my hand, but I, I know how to do basic electrical, and that's a skill that I'll carry with me for the rest of my life. But right there, I spent zero dollars on electrical other than the actual materials, which I think amounted to a couple hundred bucks in wiring. Now let's talk about how I actually financed this thing. So this was definitely the biggest project I'd ever done in my life by a factor of a hundred. I had other people that were kind of reassuring me all the way. And at the time, I wish I was just a little bit more self-aware because when I was like, I could totally do this for $40,000, right? 
Those people were like, yeah, yeah, no, bro, you can do that for 40 grand. Oh, 40 grand? Yeah. In retrospect, I was like, ah, oh, they were trying to tell me something. But that's okay. Um, I had to dig deep into my pockets and figure this out, right? So I got a loan out through a company called Lightstream and they do private and personal loans uh, for real estate additions to your house, for cars, they, they basically do everything. And I got that loan for $45,000 at I believe was 7.54%. Now, because I thought that this build was gonna be $40,000 and I know in general, when you budget something, you wanna have 10% as a contingency, I asked for 45,000 and I was like, yeah, I'll have an extra $5,000 just in case I go over budget. Well, I did go over budget. Total, that loan was $45,000 over seven years with an APR of 7.54%, leaving me with a monthly note of $691 a month. So basic math will tell you that if I paid $72,000 to finish this thing and I had a loan for $45,000, then I was $27,000 short. Now for that $27,000 discrepancy, I dipped into my own savings and I spent $16,000 of my own money. And then I put the other $11,000 on credit cards because I figured why not earn points and bury myself in debt. <laughs> if I could go back, I would still probably do the credit card thing, but I've gotten a little bit more, uh, a little smarter in this. There are plenty of credit cards out there that'll start you with an introductory rate of 0% for like 18 months. And I wish I had known that at the time, but like I said, I was out of time, I was over budget, and I just wanted to be done with the construction of it. That credit card bill came out to about $150 a month. So that paired with my main loan, which is $691, came out to about $841 a month. When I got my first tenant in the tiny house, I was charging him $1,500 a month. So I was making about 700 bucks a month just off of that. So I made sure to attack my credit card debt first because that was the highest interest. I think it was like 26, 27%. And luckily I was able to get that down super fast. So I don't really owe anything on that. Now the only thing that I owe on this house is that original $45,000 loan that I took out. But considering that it's been a couple of years and I've made a few extra payments just to try to be diligent on my payback schedule, now I owe roughly $28,500 on this tiny house. I owe a lot less money on the house now than when I started and I'm really proud of that. I mean, sometimes it is very tempting to take the money that I make from the cash flow and use it to buy myself and my family things, but you know, at the end of the day, I know that paying this debt off fast will inevitably leave me with more money in my pocket at the end of the day. Especially considering that 7.54% is not particularly a low rate. I mean, that is much higher than my highest student loan by like two or three points. So my goal is to finish paying this thing off as quickly as I can and then finally be able to reap the reward of all the hard work that I've put into this house. All right, that's good. <laughs> If you have any questions about anything that I might have missed, anything that wasn't clear, or if you just wanna know the specifics on something that I just talked about, be sure to leave me a comment down below and I will do my best to answer them. I try to go through my comments every day and answer any questions that my audience has. Also be sure to follow me on Instagram at Rob Built. I try to post there as often as I can and there you're gonna get more of a taste of my day to day as it pertains to DIY projects and tiny house updates. Now let's talk about the fun part, which is making cash. Now when it comes to renting out your tiny house, there are really two strategies that you can take, which is, housing long-term tenants and housing short-term tenants. Long-term tenants are anyone that's over 30 days. Short-term tenants are defined as anyone staying in your house for 30 days or less. And that's hosting on different platforms like Airbnb, VRBO, HomeAway. I choose Airbnb, I'm a little bit more loyal to Airbnb because that's where I got my start. And I've always had a really good experience with them. If you're considering becoming an Airbnb host, I'll leave a link in the description down below. And you'll actually get a bonus when you sign up and host your first stay. So when I actually finished my tiny house, even though I knew I could make a little bit more on Airbnb, I elected to go with a long-term tenant. And that's because that long-term tenant was one of my best friends. And I gave him a rate of $1,500 a month. Let me be clear that $1,500 a month is a really good rate. But considering I had spent so much money on this and I was out of time and out of budget and I just wanted to start making money on the thing, I was okay with that because A, it was a friend and B, I just wanted that long-term stability. He ended up living here for a year and a half, so I ended up making about $1,500 a month for 16 months, and I was really happy with that. But if I was looking to rent this tiny house on a long-term basis now, I'd really be looking to get $2,000 to $2,200 a month, and that is all bills paid. Now, you can get an apartment, a one-bedroom apartment that's bigger than this in Los Angeles for that price or much less, but it's all bills paid, it's fully furnished, and you have your own backyard, and you're not sharing an apartment building with 500 other people. So it really is a trade-off for people to get a smaller space, but they get more privacy. And also they have me as a landlord, so you can't lose. Long-term tenants were great for a variety of reasons. I mean, for one, you're sharing your property with just one person versus a lot of people coming in on Airbnb, and you have that long-term stability. But there are also cons like, 
you know, harsh eviction laws and laws that don't favor landlords in California specifically. And so I just prefer to avoid that dilemma altogether. And that really brings me to why I like short-term rentals. You can make a lot more money, sometimes twice, sometimes thrice the amount of money than you can on a long-term renter. My favorite thing about hosting short-term is the fact that I can actually use my space whenever I want, especially if I can make the same money long-term. So what that means is, you know, for example, in January, my wife and I had our sweet, sweet Isla Rue, and you know, we had family in town basically every week and every weekend for the first two months. So we were able to block off our tiny house and let people stay here. And then whenever people weren't staying here, we could host people on Airbnb and we still made more money than we do long-term. My long-term tenant moved out at the very beginning of January. And then like I said, my wife and I had our sweet, sweet Isla Rue. So we didn't host anyone for all of January because we had family in town that entire month. So we made no money in January, totally fine. And then in February, we still had a decent amount of friends and family visit for about 10 days. So I was only able to host for 20 days that month. And in that 20 days, I made $2,436, which is pretty significant when you consider that if I had hosted those other 10 days, I would have easily cleared anywhere from three to $4,000. But we won't think about that. Then in March, I had no more friends and family visit, so I was ready to finally host my place for an entire month and make great money. And then the sickness that shall not be named. Have any brew you want, as long as it's a Corona. Thanks, man. Fell upon the earth. And uh, I got cancellations on the back half of that month, but I was still able to pull $2,444 that month, which honestly, I consider a win. To be honest, it was kind of a scary time because the thing that I loved most about Airbnb, which is hosting people from all over the world, was now something that was not sounding so appealing. So I thought maybe I would shift back to my long-term strategy. But it was at that time that California placed a restriction on evictions and basically made it to where tenants could stop paying rent without any real repercussions. I mean, it's a little hairy and we can get into that in a different video uh, topic, but I didn't really want to be put in a position where I would be made the bad guy because, you know, I, I'm not. I swear, I swear. Then I thought, how could I better serve my community? And I was reading that a lot of travel nurses were needing homes to stay on Airbnb and a lot of hosts were turning them down because they were scared. So I did a little bit of research and I talked it over with my wife and we decided that it was totally no big deal to host frontline nurses in a house that's completely separate from ours 100 yards away. I mean, there's really no downside here. And so I basically gave long-term discounts to those nurses. My first nurse booked her stay for a total of 32 nights, basically all of April. And that stay came out to $1,979. So I was still making more than my long-term renter. And then in May, that first nurse extended her stay another week. And then I got two more bookings. And that month I made $2,134. And now it's June and it's basically the same story. The very first week, I hosted a frontline counselor. And then these last two weeks, I was hosting a frontline nurse. That came out to about $2,000 as well. So overall, a little bit less, but pretty consistent. And now it's July and I'm hosting a travel nurse for 32 nights for a grand total of $2,443, which I'm good with. I mean, obviously I would make more money if I was hosting more people for one to three night stints with no discount. But at the same time, travel nurses are A, working all day, and then B, whenever they are home, they're basically sleeping. So it kind of feels like no one has been in this house for the last three months, and it's been a pretty enjoyable experience thus far. I really don't know whenever I'm gonna open my tiny house back up to shorter term stays, because like I said, I've really enjoyed this experience. So for now, I'm gonna be hosting nurses long-term indefinitely. But I do know that if I opened up my calendar to short-term rentals again, I'd be charging $125 a night. And at 20 nights, that's $2,500 a month, which is really on the low end. At 25 nights a month, that comes out to $3,125, which again, I consider that to be on the low side. I'm usually booked anywhere from 28 to 30 nights a month. And usually on a tiny house like this, in this area, I would most likely be 100% booked. At 28 nights a month, which is closer to my average, I'd be making $3,500 a month on this tiny house. And then lastly, in the very best case scenario, if I were to book this place for 30 nights, which I've done many times in my Airbnb career, at 125 a night, that comes out to $3,750. $3,750 a month, that's like, that's like Tesla Cybertruck money right there, which that's my goal. If you multiply that by 12 months, that comes out to $45,000 a year. But given that I've been making anywhere from $2,000 to $2,400 a month, let's just average that out at $2,200 a month, that would give me a yearly revenue of $26,400. <laughs> given that my note on this house is $691 a month, that comes out to $8,292 a year. Now, if you take my $26,400 revenue and you subtract it by my note of $8,292, that comes out to $18,104 a year that I make on this tiny house 
in profit. Now, if you take the $18,000 that I'll make on this tiny home here in Los Angeles and the possible $40,000 a year that I might make on my Mariposa small home, which I'll leave a link up here to the overview for you to watch after this video, that's a combined total of $58,000 that I'll be making on these two properties total. I do have another tiny house in Joshua Tree, California that's almost identical to this one. It's a little bit nicer and I expect to make about $24,000 a year on that property as well. And it just goes to show you that you can make a pretty good income on tiny home and small home rentals. You just have to be willing to do a little bit of work, get creative and figure out how to finance it. Now you don't have to build a stick built house like this one. I mean, this is a really expensive project, especially the one in Joshua Tree, California. There are other kind of tiny homes that you can put up for much cheaper. I've got an Airstream, an A-frame, a yurt, a bell tent, and all of those cost significantly less than this house and they still make pretty good money. If you're interested in learning more about my off the grid experiences, Again, leave me a comment down below. If enough of you are interested in learning about something, I'll do a video over it. I'm always looking for more content from my channel. But for now, I'm gonna end the video here. I hope you learned a little something about tiny houses. And uh, more importantly, I hope that maybe it prompts you to take the next step in your tiny house journey. If it does, let me know. But uh, until then, I'll catch you on the next episode of Raw Built. Bye.